This map shows the key targets in the strategic bombing campaign relative to aircraft manufacturing and ball bearing plants. The red circles mark the latitude and longitude in the official records of those plants. There are 35 of such locations marked on this map that the Allies attacked in 1943. Notice the number of targets in France where that country's contribution to the German aircraft industry was quite significant. In fact, some sources assert that almost half of Germany's transport aircraft in 1943 came from French production facilities. The 8th U.S. Army Air Force could attack targets in France, Belgium, and the Netherlands with the benefit of fighter escort. However, in the fall of 43, the limit of those fighter escorts ended on a line roughly from the city of Aachen to Emden, Germany. Without fighter escort, the Luftwaffe shot the 8th Air Force formations to pieces. They committed their ME-109s, Focke Wolf 190s, and employed their twin-engine fighters like the BF-110 with their heavy cannon to good effect. perfect example of the problem of long-range daylight bombing missions is what happened on August 17, 1943. Curtis LeMay, commanding the 4th Bombardment Wing, was to lead, and by lead, he would personally fly in the first B-17 with 197 aircraft to attack Regensburg, then fly on to North Africa. Simultaneously, 1st Bombardment Wing with 230 B-17s would attack Schweinfurt then they would return back to England. The concept was that attacking multiple targets would divide the German fighter formations, making them less effective. Unfortunately, heavy cloud cover prevented the first wing from taking off, and the well-planned, synchronized attack turned into two piecemeal efforts. The Luftwaffe fighters attacked LeMay's force, landed, refueled, rearmed, and returned to the air to mull the mission over Schweinfurt. Total Allied losses amounted to 60 aircraft and over 500 men. However, the Allied losses were not all in vain. Albert Speer, the Reich's armaments minister, estimated a 34% loss in the production of ball bearings, which forced the German war machine to fall back on its reserve stocks. Speer was afraid that another strike of such magnitude would cripple production. However, a quick second strike was not to be, and it took until October for the 8th Air Force to mount another offensive deep into Germany. That offensive began on Friday, October 8th, and consisted of six days of maximum Allied effort, including missions to Schweinfurt, which would infamously become known as Black Week. This effort cost the 8th Air Force 148 bombers and their crews. These were loss rates of roughly 25% of the planes that made it to the target, which was unsustainable. Therefore, the 8th Air Force halted further missions deep into Germany. And it is important to note that most of the losses they suffered were from Luftwaffe fighters. Furthermore, Luftwaffe fighter power was increasing. During the 1943 strategic bombing campaign, the proportion of Luftwaffe fighter aircraft defending Germany went from 30% to nearly 60% of their total available force. And fighter production was increasing from 700 to 850 per month from the first half of 1943 to the second half of the year. However, a couple of things were happening that pointed to a glimmer of success in the campaign. First, after the October missions, Albert Speer decided to decentralize production with some facilities being distributed among the surrounding villages and with others placed in small towns in eastern Germany. 
Second was a pronounced improvement in Allied daylight bombing accuracy. As late as July, the bombers were putting only 13% of their ordnance within 1,000 feet of the aiming point and 37% within 2,000 feet. In October, the accuracy numbers had increased to 27% and 54% respectively. As 1943 turned to 1944, the nails for the Luftwaffe's coffin began to come together. American industrial power had enabled the 8th Air Force to muster over 1,600 strategic bombers and the 15th Air Force base in Italy almost another 600 more. As important was the arrival of the long-range P-51 Mustang with its drop tanks, which would reach numbers in theater of over 600 by the end of January. In late November 1943, Allied planners reinforced how essential it was to achieve air superiority for the upcoming invasion of France and put together Operation Argument. Newly appointed Strategic Bomber Commander General Spots insisted that Operation Argument must take place before the end of February 1944. The plan consisted of another week-long maximum effort with the 8th and 15th Air Forces bombing aircraft and ball bearing plants deep inside Germany, while the 9th Air Force with its tactical fighters and bombers would conduct diversionary missions. British Bomber Command would continue to attack urban targets at night. In January, the Allies had the resources, but they required a week's worth of clear weather over Germany. Have you ever been to Germany in the winter? Because consecutive days of clear skies can prove, eh, well, rather elusive. But finally, on Friday the 18th of February, the forecast was promising enough to allow commanders to give the go-ahead for Operation Argument on Sunday the 20th. Let us take a look at the targets that were hit on the first day. A quick side note, I have put a link to uh, this site uh, where you can view this map on your own. You have the ability to change the map type. And you also have the ability to change which day you want to look at. And when you hover over an icon, it will give you the general target location, target type, and the primary aircraft type uh, that bomb the target. Now, I've researched a number of documents to put the data together that feeds this map. So if you see any errors or omissions, uh, please let me know and I shall set it straight. So for the first day, you can see that the aircraft plants around Gotha and Leipzig were hit and hit hard with the Leipzig plant suffering considerable damage. The targets around Rostock were secondary with the primary one at uh, Poznan in Poland, uh, but that was covered in clouds. Incredibly, the 8th Air Force only lost 21 bombers and four fighters on the first day. Meanwhile, the 15th Air Force had planned to bomb Regensburg, but had to turn around because of uh, heavy cloud cover over Northern Italy. All in all, the first day was a great success. Day two of Big Week proved another success with the 8th Air Force targeting the Luftwaffe itself, hitting airfields around Hanover and in various locations in northwest Germany. The 8th Air Force lost 23 bombers and 8 American fighters were lost with claims of 24 German fighters shot down. Once again, the 15th Air Force did not participate as its airfields were totally fogged in. Tuesday was less than spectacular. First of all, the Luftwaffe changed its tactics of hitting formations over the target area and instead hit them as early as possible. This resulted in a running aerial gun battle across the European continent. Additionally, 
over 300 B-17s slated to bomb the ball bearing plant at Schweinfurt were recalled because of poor weather conditions. The poor weather and heavy winds also affected a group of 177 B-24s resulting in the accidental bombings of such places as Arnhem and Nijmegen. The 15th Air Force was able to attack Regensburg but lost 12% of its aircraft in the process. It was no better for the 8th Air Force, which lost 41 of its 430 bombers. After three consecutive days of maximum effort, the exhausted crews of the 8th Air Force were able to rest and recuperate. The 15th Air Force did not have that luxury, and 102 B-24s were sent to Steyr, Austria, to bomb the Volkslagerwerke, a new ball bearing plant established as part of the October Black Week industrial dispersion. The losses were heavy, but the mission reduced German ball bearing capability by over 15%. Day five saw the execution of a well-planned and coordinated attack by the 8th and 15th Air Forces. Three targets paid the price, Gotha and Schweinfurt, Germany, and once again, Steyr, Austria. Allied escort fighters were paying their dividends. Over Schweinfurt, 10 Allied escorts were lost while shooting down 37 of their foes. And so much for German decentralization. The Reich had only moved a fourth of its machine tools from Schweinfurt at the time of the bombing. And the 238 aircraft that bombed the place, well, took care of them. Then that night, 734 RAF bombers using fire still burning from the American attacks as their beacon, came over Schweinfurt and added insult to injury to the center of the German ball-bearing industry. Friday, February 25th, marked the final day of Big Week, and the results met Allied expectations. It signified, for the first time, that the 8th and 15th Air Forces were able to hit the same target area on the same day. Four aircraft plant facilities were pounded into oblivion. The Messerschmitt facilities in Augsburg, Regensburg, and Firth, the boyhood home of Henry Kissinger, by the way, and Daimler-Benz in Stuttgart. Now, the 15th Air Force lost one-fourth of its bombers, but the 8th Air Force, with its escorts all the way to the target and back, only lost a dozen aircraft. These raids reduced... Messerschmitt aircraft production to one-fourth of what it was prior to the attack. Indeed, German fighter production never recovered from Big Week, and the Allied forces quickly went on to gain almost total air superiority. 